Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Hey, it's great to see you all. Uh, glad you could join us today. John and I are talking to our favorite Hollywood historian, Manny Pacheco. How are you doing, Manny? I am doing swell. <laughs> Manny, uh, you know, it's Holly, uh, it's, uh, pardon me, Halloween season. Ooh. Well, we can call it Halloween. I don't and, mind. <laughs> and, we, and when we talk about movies, of course, you cannot ignore the, the horror genre, the monster movies. Um, they've, 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 just the whole idea has blown up to find four or five different avenues of mm. scary movies. But oh, yeah. my mind goes back to Lon Chaney Sr., mm. the man of a thousand faces. And I, when I hear the name Lon Chaney, I think of that one image of him with the, the nose. He, he did things to his face that made him look unbelievably different. Yeah, and he really he was the he was really the uh, pioneer of of makeup artistry and film. So yes, yeah, he did yeah, some. But great he, a lot of his films were, uh, it was before horror films, but they were scary films. He he created some really scary char characters. Oh yeah, uh, you know the Hunchback of Notre Dame, and of course the Phantom of the Opera are the big ones, uh, and he did others. Um, Lon Chaney is an interesting man. Um, uh, just a big brute of a guy who could just scare the bejesus out of you in, in the silent era, which made him maybe arguably the most popular silent uh, performer of the era. And I mean, that's saying a lot when you've got Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin and Douglas Fairbanks and, and uh, John Barrymore. But I really believe he was more popular than just about anybody except for maybe Rin Tin Tin. So Lon Chaney <laughs> understood he understood the isolation of people who lived on the fringes. And he learned that because his parents who brought him up were both deaf. Really? And he, he protected them because back in, back when they were young lovers and they were about to have a baby, everybody in their family, their neighbors, their friends, warned them not to do it because back then in the uh, late 19th century, it, it was there was a belief that if you were both deaf, there's a good chance your child would be born deaf. Now, obviously, that's just a ridiculous notion. But, uh, you know, it just made it, it, it ostracized the family. So the family was very, very close. Lon Chaney learned to communicate by using his facial expressions to tell stories to, to his parents. And, you know, that's that's where he learned his craft, but he learned much more. He learned how to treat people with disabilities with a lot of pathos and a lot of care. And um, he had a chance to play, I think, arguably would have been his defining character, uh, the man who laughs, which would have been it, 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 the, the, the paint, the face paint would have made him look exactly what, what would have become the Joker in the Batman series. But instead, uh, because he couldn't be lent out to Universal at the time, and he was with MGM, uh, they ended up giving the part to Conrad Veidt, the guy who plays the mean German in Casablanca. And so that kind of set Conrad Veidt's career in motion. But, you know, I think Lon Chaney would have been a huge actor when talkies emerged. And, and he made his first talkie in 1930. It was a remake uh, of, a, of an earlier film he did, The Unholy Three. But he developed throat cancer, and he died shortly after. So we really don't know the brilliance that might have emerged um, from Lon Chaney. But what we do know is that he had a son, and that son's name was Creighton Chaney. His son was named Creighton Chaney. And Creighton was told by his father that he really shouldn't work in movies. You know, the typical father-son thing. Ah, don't work in movies. Get a real job. You know, do that kind of thing. Creighton loved his father. He loved his grandparents. Understood the, the big heart that his father had, especially for those people that were just, you know, on the edges of society. And so he really adopted all of these things, and he applied them. When he be eventually returned to Hollywood, he, be he, he didn't return. He actually came to Hollywood to appear in his favorite style of movie making. And in the early 1930s, he made 
dozens and dozens of Westerns. He was a big fan of the Western. Really? Craig now, Cheney was a big fan of the, of the Western. Now, forgive me for um, saying this, but I, I, I'm trying to think. I know Lon Chaney Jr. Uh, much better than I know Lon Chaney mm. Sr. Because Lon Chaney Sr., even though they were iconic parts, I, I can't think of having seen more than one of his movies. But Lon Chaney Jr., he had a long, successful career. For some reason, all I think of is Lon Chaney playing horror characters. Oh, of course, but this was, that was to come. I mean, he hadn't even changed his name yet, and it wasn't even his idea to change his name. So here we got, we have, if, if you see some of these early 30s movies, maybe from Republic Pictures or maybe one of the other smaller pictures, you'll see the name Creighton Chaney. And, and usually, because he was a big kind of an oafish guy, he would play the heavy, the bad guy. And so, you know, he was making, he was very happy making B-Western movies. He was thrilled. He could have done that his entire career, and he would have been satisfied. But a part emerged that changed everything for Creighton. And he was approached to appear in a John Steinbeck's Of Mice and Men, where he would play the, uh, the big guy, Lenny. Mm. And um, it, it was there and then that it was suggested that he change his name. And everybody felt that, you know, a change to, let's say, Lon Chaney Jr. would be big, big box, box office. But he went to his grandparents and he, and he kind of suggested the situation. And they said, they said, what a loving tribute that would be to your father. And so he went back and he agreed that he would now perform as Lon Chaney Jr. And arguably, as good as he was as the Wolfman, his performance as Lenny in Of Mice and Men might have been his finest hour. And he probably would have been nominated for an Academy Award, but the film came out in 1939. And we, you know, we've been through that. <laughs> you know, 1939 was just this big, big year of movies. But it did lead to him um, being asked to join the, the uh, company of um, monsters at Universal. Because truth be told, the whole Dracula, Frankenstein, mummy thing is starting to play out. So they were looking for a new monster. And here's Lon Chaney. And now he gets to emerge as a new monster, the Wolfman. But Lon Chaney Jr. had a rule that he really set down in his contract, that he was going to play the monster with pathos. If you, if you look at the bad guys in The Invisible Man or The Mummy, or even, even in, in, in Frankenstein, I think, although Frankenstein's a very, very pathetic character i'm mean, very you know you feel for him um dr jekyll and mr hyde i mean these people are all kind of without any kind of any kind of heart any kind of soul if you look at lon cheney he plays the wolfman with such pathos in in the opening scenes when he care he kills bela the wolf that played by bella lugosi um he actually saves a girl before he gets bitten so he's already a hero but now he's cursed by becoming a werewolf and, and he does everything he can to keep from being out in public when he turns into a wolf. He locks himself in rooms and he gets himself tied up. He does everything he can to stop from committing murder. He is really an anti-hero when, you know, when anti-heroes could only be found in gangster movies. So, I mean, he really played the part with pathos. And you know what it did? It reinvigorated the universal monster films. Audiences started rooting for the Wolfman. They never rooted for Frankenstein or, 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 or definitely not Dracula. Women might have fell, fallen in love with Dracula, but they never rooted for him. They were rooting for his character. And that is all due to the savvy and the understanding that Cheney's had in creating these characters from the fringes. You know, it's now kind that, of interesting, uh, a senior... Uh, and by the way, I, I had never known that there was a son other than Junior. And well, there's, for, no, there's only one son. His name's Creighton, and he changed his name to Lon Chain. So that, again, it's, one, one, it's, it's a Pachecoism. That's, <laughs> that's what you get when you listen to Manny Pacheco. But Senior, uh, who uh, I admired as, a, as, a, as an actor, it seems that he basically developed um, makeup uh, of the kind that today 
you have people paid hundreds of thousands of dollars just to be a makeup artist to put facial expressions and, and other bodily uh, uh, parts yeah. together for people. But he did it himself and it became part of the character. And yeah, I he, don't know, that, was there own, anybody before him box. that was that, that uh, uh, successful no, doing he, that? He really was the start of what, what we call the modern makeup uh, era of filmmaking, and and it, it extends through the ages, and, and and you get more more recent with with somebody like Rick Baker, who owes all of his great work that he did on the modern horror films to uh, to people like Lon Chaney. So yeah, no, he absolutely should be recognized for his uh, makeup uh, expertise, and that really did make him, as you alluded to, John, uh, the man of a thousand faces. Who, oh, by the way, that was that was the name of a movie in the 1950s, and James right. Cagney of all people played played Lon Chaney. And I, I don't think the movie's all that good, but I think James Cagney is always. I mean, even in a bad movie, he always shines because his his performance was so good. If I can mention one other thing, though, that I, I would be remiss if I didn't. The real the real knowledge that that Lon Chaney had when when they made the movie, and by the way, this was the biggest monster movie in history uh, up until Psycho. When they made Abbott and Costello meets Frankenstein, it was Lon Chaney who re, who suggested to the filmmakers, the director, um, that the monsters play it straight and let Abbott and Costello do their comedy, that they should not play it serious. And that we should not try to be comical or, or comic strippish. We should actually play the monsters the way we, we've always played the monsters. It was brilliant suggestion. And that's what makes that particular monster movie so good. I mean, you never see a hint of, of comedy coming from, uh, from, from Lon Chaney or Bella Lugosi or, of course, Glenn Strange as Frankenstein. Or, you know, I, I'm just telling you. Such brilliant, brilliant uh, um, suggestion. And, of course, that still, again, comes from that Cheney savvy of how to make a film. Yeah. You know, the uh, uh, really interesting uh, tidbit that you gave us about Lon Cheney Jr. writing into his contract that he could play his characters with pathos. Um, at the time, he must have had a pretty powerful force he must have been a pretty powerful uh actor to be to get that kind of control in his contract he had the name <laughs> yeah I mean, he, he was a cheney i mean i yeah. don't know I, I think if his last name had been smith i don't know if he would have had that kind of force <laughs> or if his first name had been creighton well Creighton. well he it was creighton and he did a I lot know. of western but but you know getting back to that uh he was lucky later in his career not not in the 1960s and 70s uh, so much, but in the 50s, he was able to return uh, to his, more of his style of movie making because of a director named Stanley Kramer, who, mm -hmm. who's, who uh, he directed a litany of great talent, Gregory Peck, Burt Lancaster, Richard Whitmark, Montgomery Cliff, Judy Garland, Fred Astaire, uh, Sidney Poitier, uh, Tony Curtis. I mean, he... He directed and, and produced so many films with so many top talent. If they asked Stanley Kramer his two favorite actors, he would always go to the same two. And they were Spencer Tracy and Lon Chaney Jr. And he, was, he, he had suggested to the director, Fred Zin Cinnamon, to put, give Lon a small part in a Western, High Noon. And so that's why he appears in High Noon. And he was so happy and grateful to appear in High Noon. He went back to Kramer and says, anytime you need me for any small role, I am there. And you know what? Kramer came to him for a small role, a very pivotal a pivotal role in The Defiant Ones. So good, good for Cheney and good for Stanley Kramer for allowing him to do that. Now, I would be remiss. The, uh, here's a trivia question. I'm, I'm posing it to you, John, and to Art. It's it's a trick question, but I want to see if you can answer it. When was the last time that Lon Chaney Jr. played the Wolfman on oh. screen? God. Yeah, it's a tough question. <laughs> Wait, is this, no, this going to have something to do with uh, Hugh Jackman? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. He was long dead by then. Okay, so so Jr. I failed, John. It's up to you. Now, all I, I, you know, I would 
take a wild guess and say it had to be on television, but I, I and don't. And you know what? You are absolutely correct. Huh? It was on television. It was but on when? an e- it was on an episode, a Halloween themed episode of Route 66. No. Really? <laughs> no kidding. Not the monsters. No, no, and I, I, I want to say I, I'm, I'm pretty sure Peter Laurie was in the episode too. I want to say Boris Karloff was also, but I'm not sure. Uh, I do know that Lon Chaney was, and it was Route 66. Well, you Chaney. know, this is going to be worth uh, when we're finished doing a YouTube search to see if that episode is on <laughs> recorded course, someplace. Of course. And one more thing too, if I may say, I do a whole chapter. I, I've, I've written something like 75 chapters for my my books. And I did a chapter on Lon Chaney, my second book. And I have to tell you, when I when I go back and I read some of my chapters, this chapter that I wrote that I, I'm I'm so proud of, I think is my favorite chapter that I that I wrote uh, of all the chapters. And I've done I've done dozens, but I mean I think the Lon Chaney chapter is by far my favorite chapter. That one in the Arthur Lake chapter, but I think that Lon Chaney is still my favorite. By the, I just love it. By the way, uh, where can people find your books? Oh, they can find them on Amazon, the Forgotten Hollywood book series. And of course, if you'd like to read my blogs, we've got the uh, ForgottenHollywood.com. And I'm happy to uh, let you have some of my insights about Hollywood history, as I do on Celebrating Act Two, through my blog site. So absolutely, no, no, no charge. <laughs> the well, thank you again. Thank you again, Manny, for like an absolutely wonderful episode. Um, gee, I can't wait to... Route 66. I'm about to go actually with my wife on a little uh, trail that'll take us through Winslow, Arizona, which I'll have to sing this song and I'll do it on a, and I'll <laughs> capture it on an iPhone. But um, Route, six, uh, Route 66, Lon Chaney Jr. Snap your fingers, right? Okay. <laughs> you get your kicks. You know what it sounds like. You know what it sounds like to me, John. It sounds like Art uh, it has a little crush there for uh, George Maharis, but that's just you know. <laughs> Mark, and and what was Martin Milner? Was he like, uh, you yeah, know, Mark, chopped liver? That's right. Yep. Okay. Yeah, anyway, absolutely. now that now that we're into uh, the unforgotten Hollywood portion of our segment, I think it's time to say thank you, Manny, for a, a fascinating Creighton is junior. <laughs> wow. <laughs> thank you, Manny. You can't make this stuff up. Yeah. Thank you. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.